So I'm going to be talking about a different type of transformation than what you've been hearing before about scientific transformation. So think about what makes you who you are. Is it your childhood home? Is it where you grew up? Some people say, I was just born this way. Uh, other people say, you are what you eat, so those treats you had upstairs, is that what defines you? So let me simplify just a little bit. From the perspective of a biologist, like myself, we can categorize different characteristics into nature and nurture. Notice I didn't say versus, nature and nurture. So our genes and DNA and environment. So I'll start by talking about DNA. I have a model here that I brought. Isn't it just a beautiful structure? You may recognize the double helix that repeats over and over again. It's captivated biologists for generations. For me personally, it's very important because, oh, there we go. It defines, or it's the reason that my child has my blue eyes and my blonde hair. You know, the little bit of hair that she has, at least, is mostly blonde. But DNA isn't everything. I am from the Midwestern United States, and so is my husband, and our daughter is growing up here in Washington State. And it's easy to think that that will probably cause her to be a Seahawks fan that likes salmon instead of a Packers fan that likes walleye, but can it control more intrinsic characteristics that we might normally attribute to DNA, like her athletic ability or maybe even her cancer risk when she grows up? I'm not sure, and that's what I'm here to talk about with you today. So let me take a step back and tell a little bit about my personal story about research for how I got here. So when I was in graduate school at University of Minnesota, like I said, from the Midwest, I worked on a topic called maternal effects. So just as the food that a mother eat, eats and the drugs that she takes might affect her developing offspring, the environment that a plant experiences, like light and sun, affect her developing seeds. So it's very similar in that way. We were particularly interested in the maternal effects of competition. So what that looks like is if you imagine two plants, so one is growing all by itself, maybe in the middle of a field, while this one on the bottom is growing with lots of neighbors around it. It's pretty easy to think about that one on the top is probably receiving a lot more sunlight, a lot more resources than the plant on the bottom. Therefore, that one on the top might be able to put more resources into its seeds, producing really large seeds, while the one on the bottom might be producing really small seeds. Now, really the more interesting part about this is this can actually go on even longer. So those large seeds might grow into large plants, while those small seeds might grow into small plants. Now, trying to figure out how this works is just generally interesting to us as scientists, but also more applicable is that farmers would really like to be able to continue to grow crops and continue to produce high production with increasingly fewer and fewer resources, and that's what we're looking at. So during that time, we were able to start to pick apart some of the genetics and some of the environment, how it influences these maternal effects, as well as some of the uh, genes that control these things. But we also observed something kind of interesting in that when sometimes DNA just wasn't as, as important as we thought it was, so we had a couple of different plants that were exactly the same. They were clones of each other. They had exactly the same DNA, but they responded very differently from the environment. And we didn't know why. That brings me to the topic of this talk, which is epigenetics. So what epigenetics are, are it, what it means is literally above the genes or above the genome, and it refers to modifications to your DNA and other things that change gene expression. So I'm gonna, I, it's gonna be hard to do this with a mic. So what, to think about it, think about it like this. Here we've got what are, was our blown up DNA right here. And imagine instead that this port of beads is our DNA. And each one of these beads on here is a gene. So it's not like DNA is just floating around in your body all loose like that all over the place. That's not what happens. Instead, most of the time, it's really tight packaged inside your gene. Inside your nucleus. So it's wrapped around these proteins that are represented by my hands here that are called histones. 
One of the best analogies I've heard in thinking about epigenetics is to think as your DNA as the hardware in your computer, while these epigenetic data tags I was talking about are the software in your computer. So they control the hardware. So you know you're always getting updates from Microsoft. You're always having to change. Um, uh, be ready for new things and changing your software quite regularly, but you don't change your hardware very often. So think about epigenetics controlling the genetics. So let me talk about just a couple examples in humans that will help you think about what this means to you a little bit more closely. So look up on the screen here. Do you see any foods that have been in the news for being particularly healthy? So up on the left, you can see dark green leafy vegetables. Down on the right, you can see uh, broccoli. We've got lentils. And then avocado there has really been in the press lately as being a superfood. So what all those things have in common is they're very high in B vitamins and folic acid. And what we know is that those B vitamins and folic acid can be converted into other chemicals that are those epigenetic tags that attach to your DNA and turns those genes on or off. What's particularly interesting is that these actually usually turn genes off and turning off cancer genes, which they can do, can prevent you from getting cancer. This is particularly important very early in development, so when fetal development is happening, uh, these epigenetic tags are being set, and it can actually stay with you for all of life. So this research is really new, but it might be the mechanism for why taking folic acid during pregnancy can reduce neural tube defects, and also why high folic acid is actually associated with lower cancer rates. So the example I just talked about is really just within a generation, just within your lifetime. Probably the most famous epigenetics-related research in humans is this series of studies of a small parish up in northern Sweden. You can see it on the map there. So this parish was Swedish-speaking. It was surrounded by Finnish and Sami language communities. So there was very little trade between that community and outside areas. Um, also, there were very large families there. Parents died very early often. And they would harvest all the crops in fall and kill off much of the livestock, livestock in fall. And that would be all the food you would have till that next spring. So it's pretty easy to imagine that here, a uh, good harvest would mean abundance, or a bad harvest would mean starvation. So what these researchers did is they actually looked at people from that parish in the 1980s and looked at how long they had lived and what they had died from, and then they took historical data to correlate that back to their parents' and grandparents' generations, specifically if their grandparents and parents had access to a lot of food early in life or not. And the big result that they found for this was that grandfathers who starved produced grandsons that lived an average of 32 years longer than grandsons whose grandfathers had had a lot of food. So interestingly, they really found that abundance or starvation two generations before had a huge effect on lifespan. And they also began to correlate this with the grandsons who actually dying from cardiovascular and heart disease. So I hope that these examples that I just discussed are starting to show you some parallels between this and my maternal effects research. So now that I have my own lab, I'm working out at Central Washington University, just, just up the road in Ellensburg, we're starting to try to pick apart the genetic effects and these epigenetic effects that control plant response to stress. So one of the stresses we're looking at is light stress that I mentioned before, and we're also specifically really interested in looking at drought stress because that's very relevant to this area. We definitely want to be able to continue growing things in an agricultural region under climate change and under less and less water availability. So this research is quite new for me. I'm just getting started on some areas of it. And honestly, this topic is relatively new overall. So I hope you stay tuned for more. And also think about, you are what you eat, and what your parents ate, and what your grandparents ate, and experienced after all. And I hope that I continue to figure out why. Thanks for listening.